go. Welcome to another episode of Grieving Voices. Today, my guest is David Woods Bartley. As a mental health speaker, educator, and trainer, David has seen his fair share of successes and setbacks from directing a nationally recognized nonprofit to battling a life-threatening mental illness. It was the latter, a brutal knockdown, drag out fight with clinical depression that led David to a suicide attempt. Welcome to the podcast, David. Thank you so, so much for being here. Um, I'm excited because like I've shared with you before in email um, and before we started to record, uh, this is a topic, mental health, suicidal prevention is something that is very much needed. I think everywhere, but I definitely feel it within, in my state, in my community and surrounding area. So again, thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you're doing, not just to shine the light on mental health, but in particular grief, because I think it is every person, not everybody will have an experience of depression or suicidal ideation, but we all experience grief. And I think that there's, I think that there's an equal stigma to grief and there's always a timeline associated. If we lose somebody, then we have X number of days or weeks or months to process it. But then after that, then we are stigmatized because we're taking too long. So thank you for what you're doing, because I think in the absence of pr being able to process grief, I think that would lead into a condition that I experienced, which would be depression and untreated can ultimately potentially take somebody's life. So tell us about that journey for you, when, when it started for you, and yeah, we'll start there. So the, in terms of the, the way I begin most talks is to talk about a day in my life that was like no other. And that was August 31st, 2011. And for most people, this rather average hump day was indeed just ordinary and run of the mill. But for me, it was like no day I had ever experienced because that was the day I was going to kill myself. And that was the day that the monster known as clinical depression, after passionately trying for close to 40 years on that day, convinced me beyond any doubt that I was worthless, useless, pitiful, grotesque, stupid, ugly, that I'd become an embarrassment and a burden to my family. And most damning was the fact that on that particular day, the monster convinced me, not just as a passing thought, not just as, well, maybe, but truly, albeit illogical, I believed it to be true that everybody in my then life, my former wife, Deanna, my family and my friends on that day, I believe that their lives would improve exponentially in the wake of my death and the absence of my pitiful and grotesque existence. So the time I was living about 30 minutes east of Sacramento in Northern California, about two hours west of San Francisco, and I lived on this two and a half acre parcel with Deanna. And I remember that day here in Northern California at the end of August, there's no chance of rain and there's almost never a cloud in the sky. And I remember Victoria going out that morning and it was like Michelangelo had come down and done a, his version of, of a blue sky. And after a while being outside, and we lived in this beautiful area, I went back into the house. I sat down at the computer and typed out my suicide note. And then without telling anybody where I was headed, I made the short 20-minute drive from our home in this little town called Penryn to what is known as the Forest Hill Bridge. Now, everybody knows the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge but almost nobody knows the Forest Hill Bridge, which is the fourth tallest bridge in the country. At 730 feet, it is 500 feet further off the ground than its more famous cousin. And it's important to note that this was not my first trip to the bridge. And it is universally accurate to say that suicide is almost never spontaneous. It is incredibly rare when someone just spontaneously ends their life. Most of us who suffer are plagued with suicidal ideations, as I was, in my case, for close to four decades. And so in imagining, wondering, planning what and how I would end my life, I had chosen that I would jump off the Forest Hill Bridge. And so I had made trips to the bridge, not in a some sort of more morbid way, but in the thrust of grieving and I love what Johan Hari, who has probably the best TED talk I've ever 
seen, which is everything we know about addiction is wrong. And in Johann's word, that the opposite, the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, it's connection. So we think about what's happening now in isolation. And he has a further quote that says, isn't depression in all its forms really a form of grief? Grief for the life that you thought you would have, grief for the life that you did have, grief for the life that you wanted to have. And so I imagine this in suicidal ideations, that's just what you do. And so when I arrived at the bridge on that day, I knew exactly where I was going to park. And I remember bringing my vehicle to a rest and I turned off the ignition and then I put my hands reflexively on the 10 and two position on the steering wheel, took this deep breath, opened my eyes, reached over, grabbed the suicide note, placed that right in the center of the dash. And then I took the keys out of the ignition, placed those on the note, exited the vehicle, turned back around just to make sure the door was unlocked and then faced back again, crossed over the road and then came to the, the closest part of the bridge, the bridge deck, and it's a half mile long. And if you if you Google the Four Sill Bridge, Victoria, the, the view from either side is spectacular. It's stunning. But I didn't want to look at the view. I didn't want to make eye contact with any of the passing drivers. Instead, I focused on a light post that stood right at the midpoint. And I made my way there. And then once there, turned to the left, pressed my body up against the suicide barrier, so it hit me right about mid chest. And again, not looking at the view. Instead, I focused on the water that was flowing in the North Fork of the American River. And I once again closed my eyes and I began to imagine what's the most efficient way, like how am I going to make my way over this barrier? And I'd done the calculation. It was going to take me seven and a half seconds to fall. And I thought, what's that going to feel like? What am I going to think? And then I thought, I just somehow either want to pass out or pass away before I make impact. I, I mean, there's no way I was going to survive a 700 foot drop, but I didn't want to feel the pain. And, and I was so fixated, so focused in that present moment that I can't tell you how long I was there. I don't know. But thankfully, it was long enough for a passing driver to act on a, a sense, all, it's something we've all experienced. And she looked upon the scene and thought, something's not right with this picture. She picked up the phone, called 911, and a sheriff's deputy approached me from the left-hand side and initially established contact, which is logistical, and then created connection, which is life-saving, because connection creates hope, and hope saves lives. So I was taken off the bridge and to an emergency department, and then to a psychiatric ward where I would spend the next 15 days. And when people, Victoria, found out I was there and why, they, like, does not calculate, does not compute, they couldn't get their head around it because instead of seeing me as clinically depressed, instead of seeing me as somebody who thought he was worthless, people saw me as the happy and contented co-director of a nationally recognized animal sanctuary called A Chance for Bliss. And you and I talked about this a little bit. Gizmo would have loved this place. And the sanctuary was amazing, home to as many as 100 animals at any one time. 25 horses, 23 dogs, nine pot belly pigs, goats and sheep and ducks and geese and bunnies and birds and fish and turtles and everything. Like Noah, I'm sure, would be, have been so jealous if he came back and looked at that. He's like, wow. And as I shared with you, for an animal to come, they had to fit into one of four categories. Very old, very sick, some sort of special needs, or the vast majority were at the end of life. And so Dee and I, my former bride, and I did no adoptions. And instead animals came and then they stayed until they made their transition. They went to the greenest pasture of all. And, and we became known as this forever home in different parts of the country, even different parts of the world. And on June 2nd, 2010, we were the cover story in the life section of USA Today. And so I didn't fit the image of somebody who was mentally ill. I didn't fit the image of somebody who was clinically depressed, somebody who was suicidal, somebody who was at a high risk to end their life, to kill themselves. But I think of everything that I talk about in the, in the, the wonderful opportunities that I'm given is this, is that sometimes what hurts the most cannot be seen. Sometimes great despair, overwhelming grief, soul crippling, soul killing agony lies just behind a forced smile a distracting joke, or in this case, a seemingly perfect and ideal life. 
And not even my beloved, this amazing woman, she had no idea the degree of hopelessness on that dark spot on a tall, tall bridge, just 14 short months after the mountaintop experience of the USA Today, there I was, one short movement from killing myself. But incredibly, amazingly, divinely, my life was saved. And on that day, on the day I thought would be my very last day alive, it wasn't said the, the first day of a brand new life and the first steps in what has now been a nine-year journey away from mental hellness, and then see the experience of our birthright, mental health. And so that's, that's how I am here today, to be in your loving, wonderful, incredible hands, to, to do anything I can to support the work that you do and, and hope that anything that I could say would eliminate even a little bit of suffering from a soul who may be suffering at this point. I got chills. I think I say that on every episode, <laughs> but I got chills. Um, can you take us back though to your life prior to like what set what do you think set this off the the clinical depression is it's like um i think that's actually one of uh the questions i had here um uh what are some of the causes of mental illness yeah. and and your personal experience what led to that day so it's interesting, and as I, I as I tell, the, the speech that I give the most often is called "Sometimes what hurts the most can't be seen, and sometimes what helps the most is easy to do." And in the beginning of the speech, so I tell that's the intro, and then I talk about in the second day in the psych hospital, I had this amazing experience with a psychiatrist. Now, a lot of times when we think about a, a shrink, there's no like happy image that comes to mind, but this guy walked in and he wasn't, didn't have a lab coat, didn't have a stethoscope. And there was just something about the energy, like the vibe that this guy got off and that gave off. And what was fascinating, and, and I talk about this, is that he didn't just launch into clinical questions. He, what he was using, he was leveraging curiosity to create understanding and understanding creates connection. And little did I know it, then there was this kind of essence, this mist of hope, which was, I felt it because it just felt different. So anyway, at one point he had to shift after he'd asked these questions and about the animals and everything else. And he said, two questions no one had ever asked me because they're counterintuitive. First question was, David, have, is there any history of mental illness in your family? And I thought, hmm. Uh, and I'm like, wow, you know what? I haven't thought about it in a while, but my understanding is my father's father, my paternal grandfather, ended his life by suicide when my dad was really young. And then my dad died when I was young. And while I don't have any specific memories, my three older brothers shared with me that our father was horrifically and devastatingly overwhelmed with clinical depression. He didn't die by depression. He died by cancer. But at this point in my life now, I know that the, the depression can weaken every part of you to make you more susceptible. And so the doctor then said to me, says, now, David, realize what you're dealing with is depression is a medical condition. Okay, well, no one had ever said that before. And he said, because it's a medical condition like diabetes and heart disease and these other things, you can inherit the gene. You can inherit the predisposition. But just because you inherit that, any kind of predisposition, it doesn't mean you're going to suffer from it. He said, Oftentimes, there has to be something else. And if you can imagine the, the dry kindling of the predisposition for mental illness, something needs to light it, some sort of match. And he said, oftentimes, the, the sad news is it's trauma. And then, Victoria, I will never forget, he, this man shifted in his chair in this way that I can only describe. It was like compassion in form. And I love the definition by Krista Triplett in her great TED talk that compassion is curiosity without assumption. Like I didn't feel like I was just another patient. And he said, he looked at me and he said, David, have you experienced any trauma? Has there been any trauma in your life? And no one had ever asked me the question. And I thought, I don't know, like my brain went blank. So this man picked up the nonverbal clue and he said, well, you, you, David, you mentioned that you were young when your father died. Oh my God. He said, how old were you? And I said, I was seven. And he said, David, that, that's traumatic. 
to lose a little boy losing his father at such a young age, that's, that's traumatic. And then he said, has there been anything else? And Victoria, there was something else, something I had never shared. I was 48 years old at the time, but hopefully you and, and, and others have had the experience where someone has just set the table where it's so safe that you are compelled to unburden your soul with. And so I shifted uncomfortably and I took a breath and I said, doctor, when I was 11, I was sodomized and violated and tortured and raped by a Boy Scout leader. And when the words went out of my mouth, it was one of those instances in which I so desperately wanted to grab them and pull them back. I just, I felt shame and guilt and all of this. And, and then there was this silence in which it was uncomfortable. And I didn't know, did he not hear me? Or I didn't know. But again, I know now that this sweet soul was processing. And he, <laughs> he looked at me and he said, David, you didn't choose your genetics. You didn't choose your trauma. You didn't choose depression. You didn't choose suicide. It wasn't your choice. And then he reached forward, Victoria. <laughs> he took me by the hand and he said four words, which changed my life. He looked at me and he said, it's not your fault. Now, he may as well have been speaking Mandarin because the monster had convinced me it was my fault. I, I was, this was my just desserts. I had done something that was so horrific that I, I indeed needed to pay this price. And again, this sweet soul picked up on those nonverbal clues, just held my hands just a little bit tighter and said, David, it is not your fault. And this time I could hear him a little bit. And I was allowed to stand up and a longer answer to your question, my cause is unfortunately incredibly common that there can be some form of genetic predisposition, but that in and of itself is not enough. The trauma really is the thing that not only ignites it, but left unresolved. And, and grief is traumatic. Left unprocessed, left unshared, left unexamined, it, it's like a smoldering ember that ultimately will become combustible. And there's Johan Hari, I say Johan like he's my friend, <clears throat> He wrote this great book after the TED Talk called Lost Connections, in which he's a brilliant writer and a storyteller, in which he says that there's more and more data. I'm not a big data person, but there's more and more evidence that's pointing to the impact of trauma on the, as the genesis of mental illness and less and less on the genetic aspect. The genetic aspect, I think, is a contributing factor, but in the absence of trauma, I don't know, and I've never heard, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist, of an instance of mental illness that people just become mentally ill because there was this gene. I mean, it could, maybe, but in all the stories that I read about, and, and when people bless me with sharing their stories, there's always trauma. And it, it could be the, the loss of a parent. It could be the loss of a pet. I mean, you, I'm preaching to the choir in the sense grief is grief. Grief is individualized. Grief is, is personal. Grief is everybody's grief is different. And so we, we dishonor people by saying that you need to grieve this way. You, and people don't realize what the impact of, of conditions are, be it grief or COVID-19 or whatever it is, and just the vast uncertainty that we're experiencing globally right now. That all can usher people into a more exacerbated experience of mental illness. Maybe they had a lesser degree before this pandemic. And now that's being exacerbated. Or there's some who have situational mental illness and most likely depression or anxiety, and it's coming up for the first time. So I, I think those are the baseline causes. And if you had to if you had to distill it down to one word, that the cause of mental illness is trauma. I would agree. Yeah. It's so uncanny how similar our stories are <laughs> because my dad died when I was eight of cancer. I'm so sorry. And uh, thank you. And thank you for sharing your story too. Um, and I was also molested as a child. So it is a uh, trauma, right? I absolutely 100% agree with you. Um, 
and you know the other part about that is what I try to tell people now and, and I, I would imagine you do the same just having this initial wonderful experience with you with grief trauma doesn't have to be what you and I endure that but tra yep. tra trauma can be something that for one person it's not traumatic but for another person it is and so I think we cannot, if we do an incredible disservice and exacerbate somebody's trauma by trying to put it into a box that we've experienced or a box that is defined that way. And the same thing with grief. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if somebody who has been married to somebody else for 50 years and this soul dies and, and people will, I think, with all good intent say, well, you had them for 50 years and they're in a better place. And you want to say, I don't want to hear that. And then, but, and then when people give that thought, like, and the same thing with the person who can't get out of bed from depression is, well, you should get out of bed. Look, you have it better than the people who are starving in Africa. And then we, we shame those people. We've eliminated the possibility they're going to talk about it. So then their thoughts become contaminated because they have no air. We have exacerbated their circumstance. And we may be, why are we then surprised that far too many souls are walking down the path towards ending their life because the suffering gets out to the point they lose. I, I define depression as the absence of possibility, reason, and hope. There's no possibility things are gonna get better. We have lost the reason to live and hope is nowhere on the horizon. People don't die, in my opinion, Victoria, of mental illness. They don't, desire, desire, they don't die from the medical condition, they die from hopelessness. Without hope, forget it. You can live without love. You may not have the capacity to develop great faith, but if you don't have hope, you're done. You are done. And that's why I think both in, in any of the paradigm where people are suffering that the path out, not easy, but the way out is through the mechanisms, then there are many, of creating connection because connection creates hope. With hope, all things are possible. Everything. Everything is doable with hope. You can't see me right now, but I've been nodding my head like this whole time. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I just, I, I mean, I've been taking notes here. It's just so much good things. Uh, notes upon notes. Um, Let me think a moment. I'm going to have to edit this out, but where do I want to go with this next? Because I had a thought and it escaped my brain. Why are you thinking? Let me tell you a story. So is that okay? Well, maybe we can okay, segue okay. into the story. What's the story? Well, it's this whole thing that hope awakens harmony. So we can use it for later. Okay. Well, hold on. Let me find a, figure out a segue. You know, and that's the whole premise of two of my podcast is to show people and give people hope yeah. and be, through story and through other people's stories that because I love an underdog and I love an underdog who has made it through some really difficult times, turn their life around. And how did you do it? Show me how you, what you did and show me the light. And, um, I don't bring anybody on this podcast who is not willing to share their story, first of all. Um, and I don't care if you have your PhD, because I've had someone on here with the PhD. And if you're not willing to share your story, you don't make it on my podcast. <laughs> no, I get it. Yeah, yeah because, because we have to go first. We have to go first. And that's how, like you said, that's, I mean, that's how you build connection too, is in community, and grieving as a community, grieving, holding space for people, um, giving compassion, showing compassion. Oh. I love everything you said about compassion, by the way. And that's um, Krista, Krista Triplett. I mean, she has a great TED talk and, and this is that quote. I was like, oh my God, C compassion is curiosity without assumption. It's like what I call my phrase on it is blank slate listening. You know what? And then here's another thing about listening, just real quick before I forget, the greatest quote of all time about listening is from the great Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, who wrote Kitchen Table Wisdom. Please read it. An unbelievable book, collection of essays. So the great doctor says, our listening creates a sanctuary for the homeless parts 
in other people. Oh, that's so good. So a soul is grieving. I think that's why peer support in any malady, because peer support gives hope, hope defined as hearing other people's experiences. Like, oh, okay, I, you know, we, you know, dear sister, that we can become so consumed, the monster is so great at convincing of us with this whole slate of lies that we feel we are the only one who is this abnormal, this tarnished, this horrific. And then you sit amongst a group of other souls who are going through grief and loss and mental illness and anything else, you're like, oh my God. Just hearing other people's experiences gives us hope. And then, I mean, you get like, you know, Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts said that happiness is a warm puppy. Okay, if that's true, hope is a whole group of eight week old it would, Labrador retrievers. <laughs> hope just wants to be with you. Hope has no demands at all. Just wants to hang out with you, wants to sit on your lap and go to sleep. Just like, you know, like when Gizmo, you told me that have an ease is made to sit in your lap. Okay, so have an ease, probably the, the root word for have an ease is hope. That's what I just think. <laughs> You know, it's funny you bring that up because actually the reason why we got a dog, we, you know, I, I'd mentioned that we had before that we had tried the, you know, when my kids were younger, we tried the whole um, rescue dog thing, but that didn't work out too well. Um, but what, what prompted us, what prompted me to get a dog again, when my kids were a little bit older, was the fact that my youngest was going to kindergarten. Mm. And I, that same year I was closing a business and I had a lot of change. And that's when a lot of grief started coming up for me. I had been a work at home, kind of stay at home mom. And I'd been so wrapped up in that identity of being a mom and having a business, having built a business and, and choosing to say goodbye to that. Um, Although it was very difficult, I knew that it was the right thing to do, but I had a lot of grief coming up at that time. And I thought, what's the, what's the cure? <laughs> I need hope. I need a dog. And Absolutely. yeah, I, I pretty much came to my husband crying. Like I need a dog. I needed something. And in grief recovery, um, I know now that my dog was my stirb. Um, it, we call them stirbs, short-term energy relieving behaviors. So yeah, if, if we don't have hope and we don't have feel like there's something good to look forward to, we look for things to make us feel better for a short period of time. And so, like you said, I what you were leading to is like, even if you don't, I mean, that's how, how addiction happens, right? When we, Absolutely. When we don't have someone to talk to and we don't, we, we can't feel like we can express what is lying dormant within us was that emotional grief energy. We either implode or we explode and right. it either comes out as manifests as disease and, and health problems, which I was experiencing at that same time or, and I was drinking. Um, I actually ended up in the last year. I just, I next month will be a year that I quit drinking completely. Congratulations. Um, thank you. But, I say that though, just because it comes ties back to what you've been saying and that we look for things to make us feel better for a short period of time when we aren't willing to, when we don't, either we're not ready or we're unwilling to face the difficult stuff. And so what do you have to say to that when it comes to clinical depression? I mean, I think, so what I talk about is that what I was, what I've experienced, but then it, by these great coaches and mentors and therapists and psychiatrists and peer support and all these other, that the monster is not satisfied with just owning our mind. The monster wants to control our, our physiology, our psychology, and our spirituality. In other words, the, the monster wants to devour the whole of who we are, body, mind, and spirit. So I, my, by my own belief, and, and I live on the, the more severe spectrum because I, I, I still have horrific days. I still have thoughts of killing myself from time to time, but have this amazing set of tools and a mechanism. So I have put my self-care on a pedestal. There's nothing more important. And it's whole person care. It's not just one thing. I don't think that there's a, again, everybody's different. But for me, there's no 
single thing I can do to be well, I have to do all of it. I have to attend to the whole of who I am. And so for it's about sleep, hygiene. In fact, I just, I realized I had, I, thanks to my beloved Summer, who's my sweetheart, she said, I think you have sleep apnea. And so I have one of those CPAP machines and all of a sudden, my God, I'm sleeping better. So it's sleep, it's diet. I try to eat as clean as I can. Occasionally, Colonel Sanders says, come visit me because I miss you. Um, <laughs> and I, I must heed the call. Um, and then I'm really good about exercise, uh, time outside. I have a badass psychiatrist. My, he's become like a father to me. This man is incredible, an incredible therapist. And they're distinct, although I do therapy also with my psychiatrist, which is a little unusual. I take two meds. But the important thing about medication, I think there's two hurdles that we need to get, we, we ultimately get people over. The first is, okay, meds can help you. But the other thing to realize that in the best case, the best case scenario, what your medication is going to do is to quiet your symptoms. Meds are not going to cure you. It's the difference between an antibiotic and an Advil. You break your leg, assume there's no infection, you control the pain and the symptoms, you quiet them so you can go do physical therapy and everything else. The same thing is true with the antipsychotic or an antidepressant or anti-anxiety that they quiet the symptoms to allow the true curative healing effects of diet and sleep and exercise and therapy and counseling and psychiatry. And then for me, my own spiritual practice and then a sense of defined purpose. The sanctuary no longer exists, but I give presentations now around the world in which I take this aspect of mental illness and I wrap it in animal stories. And they're not stories just because I want to tell people a feel-good story. They're feel-good stories, but they all have a very specific teaching point. And my experience has been, Victoria, that for people like us who are dealing with something difficult, an animal story gives us a safe distance to relate to the topic at hand without it being right in our face. And for the people who want to understand us, somebody understand like me, they can look at the story and I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Just a beautiful way you, you explain addiction that we look at that, why would you do that? But to realize in my belief that the people, people who have mental health disorders are actually far more tied into how they feel. They can relate more to how they feel than the normal person. And so in the acute experience of those, in the absence of compulsive behavior without condoning it, you have to have some way to bleed out that intensity. Again, I'm not advocating for addiction, but there's a reason behind it. Curiosity is the greatest and the most direct path to understanding. When we understand one another, it doesn't mean we have to agree, but at least like, okay, wow, now I get it. It makes sense. And then if you want, I know you, pro you made me promise I'd tell the Joshua story. This is actually a perfect spot for the Joshua story. So Perfect. we get a call one day at the sanctuary, and, and here's the story. So old man very old man, probably in his 80s, comes into the animal shelter not far from our sanctuary with a very old dog. He was a basset hound cross, caramel, crother, caramel colored, swayed back like an old pony, had no teeth on the right hand side, so his tongue hung out. So, okay, this is an old dog, kind of a hot mess. So the man comes in to, and talks to the staff and said, hey, I was walking and I found this dog as a stray. And I thought, the right thing to do, the right thing to do would be to bring him in and, and put him, maybe he can find a home, I don't know. So the staff was like, wow, that's not like the behavior you would assume of a, of a senior person. Thank you so much. Just to help us out, if you could please just give us some information about you and where you found the dog, we'll take him in the back, who knows, maybe he's microchipped. So the man agrees to do that. Staff goes in the back, comes back and said, oh my God, we're in luck, he's microchipped. And then the staff member compared the information that was recorded on the microchip to the information that the man had filled out and it matched. Now, in that moment, I would have opened up a can of whoop ass on that man, the likes of which he had never experienced. I say, what if someone just dumped you out at the end of your life, like you had outgrown your usefulness, but this staff member, Victoria, <laughs> like the most amazing demonstration of compassion I had ever heard about she shifted the question from what's wrong with you to what happened to you? Sir, what's going on? What's happening? How can I help you? And in that moment, this beautiful man just 
burst into tears, like could not control. He sobbed, you know, when, like his whole body. And he finally was able to get himself back together. And he said, this is Joshua. I've had Joshua since he was eight weeks old. There is nothing more important. This is my best friend. I'm dying and I'm going into a medical facility and I can't take my dog. And I thought if I said he was a stray, instead of the fact I had to surrender him, it would give him more time to find a home. Mr. Rogers famously said that quite frankly, there's no one you can't learn to love once you know their story. I would have done the same thing. And here's the beautiful thing about an understanding. This is like, the, you know, <clears throat> this is the bonus. In the fertile ground, the level ground, the, the, with an understanding that has the soil of compassion, solutions and ideas, they just like, boom, it's instant manifestation. And that staff member who had asked that brilliant question, she said, <laughs> there's a sanctuary down the hill. Maybe they have room. And they called us, D and I went, I will never forget this wonderful man handing me the most important thing in his life and asking me to take care of his beloved pup. And all because somebody asked a question, Joshua was able to come to the sanctuary and be treated with dignity and respect and was able in time to make his transition. And this beautiful soul went on to end his life. And I think that that's why curiosity is the most direct path to understanding. I think curiosity is the most direct path to overcoming our fears about addiction and mental illness and grief. Because in my opinion, the opposite of fear isn't calm. The opposite of fear is understanding. The more we understand, the less we fear. So when we see these daunting behaviors, these societal conditions that are now just being exacerbated to an exponential level because of COVID and isolation and distancing and everything else, I think it's important for us to leverage curiosity to come to a place like we can understand one another. Like, wow. And, and if I think about the questions that the first responder asked me on the bridge and, and the, the first question after he established logistics was, David, what does it feel like to be depressed? like in that moment like everything went calm counterintuitive question it would be like what does your grief feel like we would think that that would put us into a more acute but it's actually that's what keeps you on the safe side of the rail of the barrier and so you know when we i think in this time in particular if if we ask people and we leverage questions of what and how not why and when you know, when someone asks you a why, it almost automatically makes us defensive. And when adds in the stress of time, but what and how are very benign. They're actually beautifully neutral. And we ask, you know, what's it like? And if nothing else, we see somebody who's suffering and struggling and, and, and maybe they're not able to vocalize and articulate the difficulty. And, and maybe the question is then, what would help you feel like you were understood? Because I think when we feel like people understand us, man, is that, that's hopeful. Like, okay, I don't, I don't feel like some alien on some planet. You can't see my notes, but I actually wrote doctor and then what happened to you? Because oh. that is one thing that doctors will never ask. Like if you go to your general practitioner, I, I've done a few of these interviews now regarding like with mental illness or just in conversation, obviously about grief. And you go to the doctor, general practitioner or whatever, they never ask what happened to you. Right. Never. You know, and I, I had about of um, postpartum oh. and what I know now it was postpartum at the time I had, some really dark thoughts and um, go to my general, go to my practitioner, nurse practitioner, share with her what I was feeling. I'll put you on an antidepressant. And it wasn't because of, well, I had a baby and then I had another baby and then I had another baby. It was this dormant grief that had been sitting there and was rising up with all the hormones and all the changes and just everything. 
And I didn't know what to do with those feelings, right. you know? And so it's just, just the things that you're saying, it's just, yep. Touching all everything, like every, every note that I have. And I'm asked, I'm wondering too, how then do you identify someone who may be clinically depressed or who is exhibiting the jolly go lucky person right. on the exterior? How, how do you, how do you figure out that out? Like how, what, what, even, cause it, even some of the people closest to you, like the people closest to you, had no clue, right? Is that correct? No, even my beloved. And, and you know, I say for, you know, my former bride is an amazing soul. who are still really good friends. Um, I was able to hide behind the velocity of our life. Like, okay, you, you can imagine. Let me just tell you, 25 horses produce a lot of manure. It's like, and we literally picked up every piece every day because we wanted this environment to be pristine anyway. Just, so I could hide behind that. And, and I think there are a lot of good actors out there. There are a lot of people like me that they call them, they fall into one or two categories. They're either smiling depressives or high functioning depressives. So you just have no clue, like keep showing up and he's getting stuff done. And so if you look at the symptoms, they're basically, it's changes in cognition. You can have people who all of a sudden are giving things away um, they may become very irritable. It's just, and so what I say to people when I, sh if I do a PowerPoint, and there's always an animal picture on it, is to, one, first, just be okay. Don't make yourself wrong. Don't be engulfed in shame if, if you don't see these, because for people like me, these can be incredibly subtle. Like, really, the only way, I think, beyond something that's just really obvious is, is to follow that in intuition that we all have. It's like, hmm, something seems off. And then you think, oh, whatever. You know, right now, it'd be, oh, it's just the stress of COVID, which could be true. But I, I think we just, we need to pay attention. You know, the, the, I love the quote that says, um, attention is the purest form of generosity. Like, let's just be a little bit more mindful of one another and look for these because these signs are really subtle. And then when, when we do like, okay, we, we have the wherewithal to step forward and leverage curiosity, we need to ask a direct heartfelt question. And it could be something like, I may be totally wrong, but I'm just feeling like, I feel like you're suffering or I feel like you just, I just don't feel like, I just feel like something's wrong. Would you please tell me how are you feeling? And I think if we can pose the question, the, is there is a difference between are you feeling okay? That's a yes and no versus how are you feeling? It's not, can I do something for you? It's what can I do? Do you feel like I understand you or what can I do to help you feel understood? People want to talk. You, they may be reticent. They may feel embarrassment and shame because there's still a stigma around this. I think it's lessening little by little, thanks to great people like you. Um, but I think ultimately people want to talk about it. And, and, and so we need to ask hard questions. There's a, a suicide prevention technique that was created by an amazing psychologist, Dr. Paul Quinette, and it's called QPR, which is question, persuade, and refer. It's kind of like CPR for mental health. Well, Dr. Quinette has this quote in which he said, it's the unasked questions that lead to tragedy. So, you know, I thought this, but, and it's counterintuitive. Like, why would that officer ask me, David, what does it feel like to be depressed? You would think, okay, that's really gonna toss this person over but again that's what kept me safe you know what's it like on your worst days you know when when you hear voices what do the voices say would you please help me understand i want to understand so i can i can serve you i can help you and then quiet and and the and you have that quote from dr remen says you know this gift of listening it literally creates a sanctuary for people. Like I had a home to live on that day, but on that dark spot on the tall, tall bridge, I was homeless. You know, and the fact that this man 
listen to me. He just listened. He just listened. That was it. He asked a question, then he listened. Like, wow, it's not really complicated. And I think what happens is I, there are available resources to process grief and mental illness and everything. And they're not perfect, but they exist. But if people don't feel connected, the door stays shut. Can, that's why I did a talk recently and I, I wanted to be a little, I wanted to grab people's attention in the talk was mental illness, a complex problem with a simple solution. The solution is connection. That, that's it. Like if we become more connected in all these different ways and become great at remembering people's names, leverage curiosity to create extension, become the master of the handwritten note. People need to hear how you feel about it. We, if you just become great with those things, you experience the mutuality of connection. It's mutually beneficial and you will change people in ways that you cannot imagine. Um, and then if I can, I'm gonna tell you a real quick, another real quick story. All that said, you can, I totally get how frustrating it can be if we do all these things. We're really looking forward to, we're looking to, to step up and, and help people. And there's no visible, we, we don't feel like what we do makes a difference. It's like, you know, and you want to give up, like I'm doing everything I can. I'm, I'm doing all these steps. And so we had this bird at the sanctuary named Kia. She was a pretty good sized parrot. She had been abused by a man. So, so she comes and we had this big great room. And then Kia, there was this armoire and Kia had this beautiful platform. She had this great view, look at all the animals and everything. And, Dee's the brilliant one who created all the, the methods in which we took care of these animals. I was really good at picking up manure. I Like, I can do it. So I was the feeder primarily. And so the first day I go up and I approach Kia's cage, Victoria, as soon as I did, she like shakes violently, turns around and, and goes to the rear of the cage. And I think, you know what? By then I'd been in rescue for a while and we'd run this. I have good energy. I'm, I'm, it's going to be okay. Go up the next day, same thing. And so I, I changed the paper and I opened the cage and I put in the water, the nuts and her treats. And she's just like, oh my God. I thought, you know what, it's gonna be okay. So this goes on day after day, after day, after week, after month, and same thing, no change. And like I'm doing all these things to make a difference and nothing's changing. And at one point I said, honey, I can't do this anymore. This is, I think I'm making it worse, you know, and like you do it. And she said, no, babe, just, I know she, she needs to know that men are okay. I know it's going to change. And so keep going on. It's not going to change. Like nothing happens. And then one day I go up and I'm like robotic, Victoria. Approach the cage and she's doing her thing. And I change the paper, open it up. And I put the water in. I put the nuts in. As I put the treats in, Kia turns around and comes to the front of the cage, climbs up and pops her head out and puts her head down. And when a parrot does that, one, they're completely vulnerable because they can't strike you with their talon or bite you. And what they want you to do is to scratch their head. And I remember like, oh my God. And so the question is, was trust created in that moment? Or was it those small acts consistently done, encouraged by this beautiful woman and it was, of course, the ladder. And then every time I came to the cage, that head was down, <laughs> scratching my head. And so, you know, the bad news is in, in, I think, a lot of instances, we don't get to see the impact of, of our kind acts. But as somebody who's been on the receiving end, including a bark in the background there, on the receiving end of an innumerable number of those, each and every one of those, even if I don't respond, they all have made a life-saving difference. And so I, I would just say, keep doing, keep making those deposits of kindness and compassion and love and understanding into the bank of a soul who's depleted. And it will in fact, and it can turn a life around. That's a beautiful illustration. Um, I was going to ask another question about a black and tan coon hound that's being very disrespectful on our podcast right now. You're very <laughs> small. I love you. Just saying hello. Just saying oh, yeah. hello. That's Gigi, everybody. Okay, so 
I suppose the principle still applies in those rules, not rules, but that idea still applies when you have kids that are not necessarily very vocal and open and it's they're kind of like tough nuts to crack you know so, exactly now so here's an interesting it's an incredible segue i don't know if i shared this so i've never had children and d and i neither of us would and then with summer who's my beloved now um she has three babies ethan is 15 bella is 12 and gracie is nine and so like okay this is a whole learning experience for me and it is it's, because I, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to learn, you know, leverage on the experience under the mentorship of my former bride. You know, they're sentient beings. That's the commonality, an animal and a child, different, but they're sentient beings. And so for me to, to recognize the subtle differences and then leverage curiosity in a way that, that works for them, maybe not be so direct on question related to depression or anxiety, but something different. And it, it's great. I'm still learning it. it it's, it's still a skill. And sometimes I mess it up horribly. Why did I say that? And there are times when at a point of relating, maybe something totally different. And for Grace and I, it's playing. Like she's super active and she'll say, David, okay, and we make up games and everything else. I remember these games, Victoria, that when I was nine years old growing up and like, oh my gosh. So we just make up all these games. And I think if nothing else, that's a point of connection for she and I. And maybe there's, she may then, we've been in each other's lives now for almost two and a half years. And there's been these moments where she has shared when she's felt anxious, when she's been depression. And, and I know she knows, I've never, the two girls, Ethan has, has seen me speak a couple of times. The two girls have not, but they, they have an idea. And I, Grace has gone so far as to say that in regards to when she's feeling depressed at times, that she says, I know David understands. So like, okay, you know? And she's, I tell you a quick handwritten note story. Mm -hmm. So Summer and I don't live together yet. We're actually gonna move in together in January, which will be great. For all the parents out there, please help me because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, oh my God, I have nowhere to run. I can escape now. now I so anyway, I'm sorry. I'm afraid. So there was this day and I was in a bad space. And I was just like, oh man, depression was whipping my butt. So Summer had said, honey, could you go by the store and pick up a few things for me? And I said, sure. And then I didn't have time to take it to her house, which is not far away. And I said, babe, I'll just have to leave it in the car and you can come by. So I'm upstairs, take a shower and I come out to my car and there is not one, but two notes on my front seat. One is from Summer, just expressing her love and support. And the second one is from Grace. And I don't have it right here and we're on a radio anyway. So it's on a piece of, of line notebook paper and it's written in purple pen. And it says, hi, David, this is Grace. Thank you so much for being the best stepdad in the world. I love you so very much. And thank you for taking such good care of mommy. Now, I took pictures of both of those, Victoria, and I sent them to Summer and I said, thanks. And she said, thank you so much because Grace wouldn't let me know what she wrote. So Gracie had no idea that I was having a bad day. And yet my child intuitively knew that in that moment, that's what I needed. This reminder that I was okay and that I was loved and that what I was doing in service to her mom and loving her mother, she noticed that she picked up that whole thing. And like, I have that note laminated. You could offer me a million dollars for that. I'd say, no, you know, I could use a million, but no, it's not. Another note I got from a young woman who's like a daughter. At the end of the note, she said, depression can't have you because you're ours. <laughs> so it's, I, I think, we might be surprised at how impactful small things are. You know, and I think what I tell people is, you know, we, each of us, because if we don't have initials past our names, if we don't have a PhD, we may think we're incapable and unqualified to make a difference. 
But I think actually it's just the opposite, that we are all universally capable and qualified because we not only can we create connection, we know what it feels like. We know what it's like when someone remembers our name and we had no expectation that they would. It's just like, you remember who I am? When someone creates a safe place for us to tell our story, when we go to the mailbox and there is, uh, let's say, unsolicited mail, and then all of a sudden there's that uniquely sized envelope and there's that handwriting, like, okay, it's going to be one of three things. It's going to be an invitation, it's going to be cash, or it's going to be somebody taking the time to let us know they love us. Because if they think we're a butthead, they're going to send us a text. So it's just these things. I mean, I'm so passionate to just say, oh, we're in such a difficult position. It is an incredibly daunting and complex problem. Grief is can be overwhelming. But if we come together in that, that pure tribal sense and offer each other support, not advice, journey with one another, not one in front and one behind, just side by side, man, let's just walk this thing together. I think, I know that's the way we can win. I, I really, really do. And grief recovery, we call it being a heart with ears. Oh, I love that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I we need yeah. more of those. We do. And they're out there. I, I just think, you know, it's just, it's a matter. And, and who knows, maybe the silver lining and all the suffering and difficulty of COVID is a reset to a certain degree. I mean, it's not a reset I wanted. Um, and in, in terms of the work that you and I do, maybe what this has done is, is focus what really, what the what really the, the most daunting problems that our society has are all in relation to mental health. That's it. Everything, you know, if there is no mental health, without mental health, there is no health. That's it. It's the foundation. It's like you're, you know, you're going to drown. And imagine when we feel well, interestingly, when I feel good, I treat other people really well. I mean, I do. It's just, you know, we stand in that beautiful place of understanding and do all these things. It's, you know, and, and courageous souls like you to bring attention to a really difficult subject, you know, like, man, that's, hi, I'm here to talk about grief. <laughs> yeah. So Someone... I'm so sorry. I had, I didn't realize I had another appointment. <laughs> someone, someone asked me not long ago, she said, do you love grief? Wow. And I'm like, it, it caught me off guard, actually. And I was like, yeah, grief is kind of my jam, but not in a way like, Oh, I love that though. Yeah. You know what? It's, it's like, like you say, like you've, you, you wrote on your, on your form here, grief has become my friend and yeah. it's been my lifelong friend like yours. So yeah. it, I, it's just so, I, I just the similarities. Um, I feel like you're a kindred spirit. So I, I, yeah, I, I am, a, I'm a bit of a, like an obsessive freak about serendipity. I just, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I don't believe in randomness or, or I, I just think, you know, you and I, the way we connect, there's no accident in this. It doesn't. And the fact that we, we are together now, all of it to me is divine in, in the most universal sense. I'm not trying to point to a certain belief system, but I just think, it's not capricious. It's just, it's like, this is what it's supposed to be. So now I have a kindred spirit, you know, a sister that understands and focuses on another aspect that I still deal with. You know, I, I don't know, I don't know if I shared with you that, so I was released from the psych hospital on September 15th, 2011. By the end of that year, I lost everything. Confluence, and it's a longer story, which we don't have to talk about now, but just everything went away. I remember very clearly handing the keys to my vehicle and the repo man drove away. We lost our support because people thought if the co-founder was going to kill himself, what must be happening to the animals, which the animals were being cared for and loved in ways that most people wanted to be. But people freaked out. They were afraid. So the animals were taken away. We lost our house of foreclosure and it was sold at auction and the marriage crumbled under the weight. And so, I mean, it was literally like a fire had come and spontaneously erupted and wiped my life out. And with a borrowed car and one of my beloved Boston Terriers, Harmony, came to live where I live now with my two brothers and sister-in-law. And 
I look back now, like you say, I went from one sanctuary to another because it has been in this sanctuary that I have been able to heal. But, and it, it's interesting, the other part of that is to, to underscore how connection saved my life on multiple occasions. When I was in the hospital, I met a guy named Don. Don was another middle-aged man who was gonna kill himself. And when Don got out of the hospital, he found this men's depression support group, a group of middle-aged men who met every Tuesday for two hours. And for six years, every Tuesday, I'd see my therapist from four to five, take a break and then go be in group for two hours. From that amazing place, I met my therapist, I met my psychiatrist, I got on the right medication. I was given the first chance to speak eight years ago, all because of a guy that I met in a psych hospital. And then you fast forward to the end of that year, had I not had the group and everything else, I didn't know the nightmare that was coming, the trauma and the grief that would overwhelm me. Had I not met Don, made that connection, there is no way in the world that I would have been alive by the end of the year. That wasn't an accident that of all the people that could have come to the mental health, the mental health, the psych ward, that, that man and I met on that day and everything that happened out of that. You and I coming together now, there's no accident. I think that life is yearning, is screaming for us to connect in these ways, to open up our eyes so we can work together to heal what's going on. And healing is indeed possible. I'm not saying it's easy. It's a lot of work. You know, I, spend as, much, I spend as much time in self-care that the average person spends in a part-time job, you know, between working out and therapy and it just it's a lot of work it is but i've had glimpses and experiences of mental health i never thought possible i'm just like wow man that yeah and and it was interesting so until like five years ago august 31st of, of the year was every year was the worst day of the year i'm a january baby i hate summer it's just I don't like the heat, not in California. It's, it's a dry heat, but still like, uh. So five years ago, I go to the mailbox and there is one of those uniquely sized envelopes. And I open it up on the outside of the card. It says, advice from a glacier, go slow, carve your own path, blah, 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 whatever. Like, I want to like toss this thing, but out of curiosity, I open it up in this big, like Crayola crayon orange print. It says, happy today. And it's from my incredible friend, Greg. And it was this support and this love and this encouragement. And as a result of that card, Victoria, August 31st of every year went from the worst day to my New Year's Day. And every year, including just recently on August 31st, I go back to the bridge and I park my vehicle in the same spot. And I walk to the midpoint, the celebration in a New Year's Day. And this last year was the most extraordinary because my beloved, whose name is mentioned just happens to be Summer, which I think is hilarious. She said, honey, I wanna go with you. And here we are, I'm walking with the woman that I'll spend the rest of my life with, the juxtaposition between the epitome of isolation to the apex of connection as we walk to that same point, all thanks to a card that showed up on that day at that time. I'm just like, that's it. That's, we, we hold it in our hand. We can do this. It's, and then when we do, we open up access to all of these resources, to the heroic souls who stand on the front line, the people who embrace becoming a mental health service worker, to become a psychiatrist and a psychologist, who, who deal with the rigors and the upset of what they call courtesy stigma, that that they share some of the stigma that we do by association. And yet they're like, that's okay, man. I don't care about that. You're, this is my peeps and I'm gonna help these people. Like all of those relationships open up when we have that moment of connection and we can create it everywhere, any place, anytime with anyone, no matter what. Thank you for sharing that. Um, just everything you've shared. It's a poochie need out. You know what? Thank you. I'm a, you're very naughty. Get out of here. You're very cute. Sorry about that. That's okay. Usually I, I can edit that out. No problem. I, you know what I ask him? I say, Jiggy, what's on top of the house? Woof. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
my gosh. I know. So that's, the thing is, that's a dad joke. I'm learning these dad jokes. You got to go to laughingfactory.com. That's my new favorite website. Uh, my, my, the one I tell the girls way too much, they say, what do you call a sad strawberry? What? And they roll their eyes and they say, a blueberry. Oh. <laughs> Why did the skeleton? For God's sakes! Why did the skeletons cross the street? I don't know. To get to the body shop. <laughs> I'm gonna say, girls, this is not my. This is Victoria. You can be mad at her and Gizmo. I did have a serious question here. Okay. Um. When I can think of it. Oh, I need to write stuff down. Well, but I, I keep, wrote so much I, stuff. I keep interrupting with silly stories. So. They're not silly. Um, you were talking about your story with the bridge and going back. Mm -hmm. And I had something on that. Oh, you know, one of the saddest things for me is to witness people who don't see their own magnificence oh. that don't even see their own potential yep. and i think the saddest thing i'm getting emotional the saddest thing about it is that so many lives are snuffed out that who knows they could have been who knows what they could have been yeah and I think of, and especially kids, um, I, you know, when I reached out to you, it was, um, we had, I learned of a suicide in my area of a ninth grader. Ugh. And, um, and that was actually the day that I emailed you. Really? Yes. The day that I emailed you. Um, after I emailed you, I heard of that. I learned of that suicide and, um, it just makes me incredibly sad. So no. how, how, how do you help someone see their own magnificence and their own potential? It's, it's really hard. I mean, one of the things that I tell people is, and here's the question I get, it's a variation of what you just asked me, Victoria, is I have somebody that I love and they, they, they're not willing to get help. And I say, Here's the thing, you cannot drag somebody from hellness to wellness. You could, you could take them, you could force them to go to a doctor's appointment and stand over them to have them take meds, but it's not gonna work. I mean, there's no longevity. In it. So I think to go back and in the midst of somebody's pain, it's the initial step before we go solution oriented, and that's our, our loving intent, our altruistic motivation. I think first it's to create the space to understand the depth of despair that they feel. And again, that may sound counterintuitive, but until we clear that out a little bit way, a little way, there's no way they can see their magnet. We have to part the clouds a little bit. And the only way I think we can do that is to allow them to express. And then the follow-up, if we can do that, the follow-up is then, what are the circumstances? What's going on in which you feel good? Like, what's happening? And then, they're going to say, well, for me, it was working with the animals. And they're like, wow, what, you know, what's that like? Like, can you tell me a story? Can you do anything? And, and you'd say, okay, well, you know, with Joshua, like, well, what was it like in that moment when you held Joshua that this man gave him to you? And that's him. It was almost indescribable. And he said, you know, do you think, what did you have to do with that? I mean, how did you participate? I mean, I guess, you didn't have to take that dog, right? Like, yeah. So one of the things that my beloved psychiatrist, Dr. C, <clears throat> has suggested, because I still have these negative cognitions, and, and they, they come on a regular basis. My, my beloved, again, my former wife, amazing, and my beloved Summer is amazing, and Summer is particularly interested. She, she hates to see me suffer, and so what she'll do is she'll say, okay, honey, I want you to write down the, the top five negative cognitions that you're having. So I'm worthless, I'm not gonna be a good dad, whatever they are. And she'll say, okay, she listens in this profound way. And then she'll say, okay, 
I hear you, all right? And then she'll say, well, I saw you do this, right? And then didn't you do this? And then you, so she'll outline what the, she's confronting the negative cognitions with just factual statements. And it's incredibly effective. It is unbelievable. And I keep all them because the negative cognitions will come back. So I bring that into an answer here that I think one, it's important just like with Summer, what Summer does is let's first, we need to express what is, what's the negativity that's holding us down right now. And then to change the conversation to potentially allow somebody to just catch a glimpse of a different perspective, just a little bit of a glimpse. And then maybe explore it a little bit better or just a little bit more and just say, well, okay, here's what I saw. You know, what do you think about that? You know, there was one that like, God, I'm never going to be, a pro I'm not going to be a good enough provider and everything else. And, and so someone says, well, I think right now you pay for our cell phones, right? Like, yeah, I do. And then you pay for this right now. And then the other month you paid for our electric bill and these other things. She says, you know, for me, that's, indication of somebody providing for a family and it, it's it is so incredibly effective at changing and really taking dismantling those negative cognitions doesn't mean the negative cognitions are not going to come back but in that moment the relief is almost indescribable giving you proof of the opposite being true exactly and see I, you we can't do that alone it's impossible i can't i don't think we can you know, we need solitude, but solitude's a choice. Isolation is not. And so we need to have time to meditate, to contemplate, whatever. But we also need the help of other people. And for as 57 years old as a middle-aged man, like, it's okay to ask for help. Like, it's impossible to become well. It's impossible to resolve grief, in my opinion, alone. I, I don't think you can do it. I, I, I can't. I can't be mentally healthy alone. It's impossible. We uh, heal in community for sure. Exactly. It's exactly. And, and, and hopefully I think, you know, the juxtaposition in terms of the angst and the despair that's going on now that is hallmarked by isolation, more and more are going to realize, okay, really the only answer to this, the simple answer is to be connected. You know, you got to be. On the national news the, I don't know, the other night, I don't know if you saw it, but they showed, it was like a before and after picture of elderly in, mm. in long-term care facilities. And it was, it was just, I, I mean, just Google it. Um, it was on NBC news. Um, not that like early, earlier this week, I believe is when I saw it, but the before and after of a matter of just like with COVID the bef I couldn't even believe the pictures. It was like two different, like one in particular I'm thinking of, her face was full. She had, you know, color in her cheeks and was smiling. And the next one, it's like, she was on her side, her cheeks sunken in, she was on her deathbed. What? And it's isolation is That's... taking so many people too soon. Well, and this is, you know, I think the monster is licking his chops. I mean, this is exactly what he wants. This is a, it's exactly. And so we had a, one of the horses that came to the sanctuary was a horse named Big Cloud. He was this beautiful, really smaller quarter horse, jet black. He, he had grayed in the face. It's beautiful. And well, what had happened was some, I'm going to use this word liberally, person had enticed Big Cloud into a trailer, probably with some sweet grain or anything, taken him away from where he was. And so Big Cloud's probably thinking, oh, you go for a ride or whatever. Well, this person, moves him out, Victoria, into this desolate place, brings, takes Big Cloud out of the trailer, and then drives away, leaves him there to die. And I think that that's, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's a paradox that I know a lot of people, a lot of people, I've heard, it's not uncommon to hear from people who suffer from schizophrenia and hearing voices that at the beginning, the voices are, they're friendly, they're supportive, they're kind. Depression at the beginning, there is a certain familiarity and comfort around it. It's kind of, it's weird. And so it, it, I mentioned that because I think that that's the sweet grain that these maladies entice us into this vehicle, but ultimately they transport us to isolation and leave us to die. 
Now, in Big Cloud's case, by the grace of, of life, a ranger in his non-regular route discovered this horse. And like, why is this horse here? And he came to live with us and lived an amazing life. Fell in love with Dolly. Oh, God. Dolly was this older white Arabian. Oh, my God. He was so smitten. And you know what's interesting about that? So they were always together. Dolly died. And Deanna and her brilliance, she allowed Big Cloud to just stay. And, and this we, the renderer, we couldn't do anything with her body for like four days. So she was you know, covered and everything else. Victoria, Big Cloud stayed with her the entire time, never left. And when the rendering truck came to take her body away, we had Deanna said, we need to let Cloud be here. And so he saw her body be taken away. And then he stayed in the pasture for a while. And then at one point after a time, he went back to the other pasture and stood at the gate saying, you know what, I'm ready to rejoin the herd. So, and we saw that at the sanctuary so many different times in which animals so openly revealed and expressed and then ultimately resolved their grief. You know, they didn't they didn't try to avoid it. It's just like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna delve into it head on. And I think in that regard, they were very mentally well. And you know it's funny because we, looking back now, D and I had established a whole person care system for the animals because we cook for them, we had practitioners come, so their body was taken care of their psychological being was was supported in a safe environment and then they were connected they, they had a foundation they had a, albeit a spiritual certainty about what was going on and so i think that model if we transpose it or transfer it to as an example for human wellness that's it learn from nature right oh man i mean you want to talk about so i'm working on a book it's funny it's <laughs> I just laugh at the title. It came from life. It didn't come from me. So the book is They Pooped, We Scooped, Unexpected Wisdom Picked Up at, a sanct at an Animal Sanctuary. Sounds like a movie. I know, right? <laughs> It'll be fun. These are, there's all these different stories. Um, yeah, they're fun. There is, though, isn't there a movie based on a true story of a man that opened the anim an animal yeah, sanctuary no no yeah there's i think there's a couple one is i think didn't matt uh matt damon played in the one yeah we right. opened an animal sanctuary i think that was even there the title I it was zoo. oh they we opened a zoo oh yeah. okay okay no, and there's some amazing people who are doing great work in sanctuaries all over the you know the, the granddaddy of them all is best friends in utah they have somewhere close to 3,000 animals. Um, there's another one in New Hampshire called Rolling Dog, which is incredible. They take special needs animals. There's a great place in Southern California called Gentle Barn. Um, there's an organization, they used to be in California and New York called Farm Sanctuary. So, and then, especially in the dog world, dog and horse in particular, there, there is hundreds upon hundreds of small independent rescue organizations that come to be because of an individual's love for a particular dog. I, I guarantee there's a Havanese rescue. There certainly are Boston Terrier rescues and everything. And these people work basically with no money and they, they're tireless because they want to help this, these beings that mean so much to them. So a lot of our animals came from different frontline rescue organizations when they had an animal that was almost impossible to adopt because we did no adoption. So they would give us the old ones and the sick ones. And so there are great people out there doing amazing work to help animals. How did you move beyond that grief of losing that thing that was so important to you, yeah. the sanctuary? I well, I mean, and, and your spouse, I mean, at the time too, I mean, you lost everything. No, so it was... Yeah, I'm still processing it. it, it I still, and you know, it's interesting, Victoria, it's, you know, again, our timing, I just realized this at the moment, I, in particular, and I'm sure there's some part of the COVID thing. I also think in an ongoing commitment, and the one thing I'll give myself credit for is to be incredibly consistent on self-care, um, that some of the other things have been processed and moved away. And so, like you had talked about, there's, there's some... I mean, we lost, I shared with you, we had 90 animals die in 20 years. 
mean, and it was so busy. Sometimes an animal would die in the morning and then another new one would come in the afternoon because there was so few places for the type of animals in that state would come. And so, right, it's just been interesting the last couple of months, like the, the grief around the sanctuary and the loss is just like, man. And so I, I try to remember grief has arrived not to annihilate me, but to support me, to allow me to, to cry a lot. Um, I write different stories um, when I tell these stories about the animals. Um, I still have shame around the fact that I lost everything. And that is dangerous because then that can, the monster can grab a hold of that. So I would love to say that I have processed all my grief, but there are some parts, you know, I may continue to grieve for maybe the rest of my life. And, and you know, I don't say that in a debilitating way. It's just, it's really, you know, to, to have something in which I thought was going to be the rest of my life, to have it be taken away, um, it's, that's hard. I mean, really, really difficult. Um, but thankfully, I don't, I don't endeavor, I, I am working my way through with a lot of people now, like, and with you, that I get to have this beautiful relationship with you, somebody I can talk specifically about grief with. Well, and I don't think we necessarily ever arrive unless we become monks. You know, I think we're always going to be processing and peeling back the layers and kind of really learning how to unlearn a lot of the unhelpful and hurtful things that we put in our backpacks yep. growing up as children. Because actually, this circles back to a point that I actually wanted to bring up is that when trauma doesn't have to be molestation, right. sexual abuse, anything like that. And I want to circle back to that because one of the very first losses children often have is a pet loss. Right. And so coming back to like, you know, your animal sanctuary and things like that, that can be traumatic for a child. Oh. And pet loss and miscarriage are two of the most minimized losses. And so what is a parent's first instinct when the child loses a pet? Well, that's okay, Johnny, we'll get another one. Right. David, let's just go to the pet store. We can get another one. Not really acknowledging and let the child process and share how they, their feelings of losing the first pet that they felt connection to, right. right? Let's just replace it. And so that's the very first lesson most of us receive as children about how to process grief. We don't process it. We just replace it with something else. Right something no, else I, to make I, us feel better, right? I, I agree 100%. And, and I think, not to shame myself, and, and I can, without it being an excuse, I, I think how busy Dee and I were, I mean, on the one hand, you could look and say, well, didn't you do that? Didn't you just replace them? And say, no, I mean, I think it was different. And I think one of the things, you know, I, both Dee and I would agree, the sanctuary became too big. And, you know, we should have, top capped it at a certain amount. Um, maybe there would have been spaces in our, in our life at that point to be able to process loss. Um, and every animal that, that transitioned did so in an incredibly dignified, beautiful manner. It would, there was a ceremony and this beautiful accord. And they were, I used to tell the animals, okay, here's your job. You know what your job is? To be adored. That's it. That's all you got to do. And so they were cared for and loved in ways that were extraordinary and, and passed in their own time. And just the remnants of it, you know, remain on me. It, it's, it is, it, it, it's hard, but I know grief is not here to beat me up. You know, grief, and you and I talked about this, it's, it, it sounds almost weird, but grief is my friend. You know, it's, it's my teacher, it's been my teacher. Yeah, it's, and it, you know, and then, you know, grief of losing my father, grief of losing my innocence to be raped, um, all these different things that, you know, there's so many aspects of grief and like trauma is trauma and grief is grief. It's all individualized. It's personal. It doesn't, something that doesn't traumatize me can traumatize you. It, it doesn't, you know what? And so we need to just be accepting and there is no timetable for healing of trauma or healing of grief. You know what? Take as long as you need. Time just passes. Exactly. It's what it's the action you take in time that matters. 
it said, you know, what between the two dashes um, in terms of dates, time you live and the time that you die. <sighs> Is there anything else? I mean, I feel like this was such a very, very deep, good conversation. Oh, I just, I'm so blessed that we have connected. Um, I feel like there needs to be two, like a part two or something. Um, I, lot, I have a lot more stories. There is, I, you know, and I, 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 this thing, I would highly recommend Johan's TED Talk. It is phenomenal. And he tells the story, this goes back to the whole thing of connection, that there, this was a, a, a scientific study that we've all heard of it, that, you know, you, they put a rat in a cage and there was a bottle of cocaine lace water and regular water and the rat always went to the cocaine lace water and killed himself. Like, oh my God, that's what humans are doing. And somebody came along later and said, uh, hold on, rats are very social. You have isolated this being. So they, they recreated the experiment. And so they made like Rattopia. There were other rats, there were hills, there were tunnels, there was food and there was water. And at the same two bottles, didn't drink the cocaine water. Didn't really? They didn't. And it made make sense because they were connected. They were part of a tribe. So, you know, we, and especially around grief, you know, somebody takes what we would consider in our, in, in my ignorance, what's well, taking you too long, not so much now, but it's taking you too long to get over this. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It's okay. But if we, if, if they feel misunderstood, they're going to retreat. And then they're going to fall back into the, the caustic arms of the monster. And there's where be, it's kind of like big cow going into that, that horse trailer there's a certain bizarre enticement and nobody understands me but this feeling of despair if nothing else is familiar and there's a certain comfort because i know what it feels like i can hang out here because nobody understands me people think i'm being stupid people people don't understand that i can't get out of bed because depression is literally weighing me down why am I crying or I can't do my job or whatever it is? Why, why did I want to kill myself? Why have I attempted suicide? Not in my case, but why am I cutting? Why, why have I attempted suicide more than one? Whatever it is, because we don't understand when people, when we feel misunderstood, we're going to retreat, we're going to retract. And if we get too far down into that hole, it's like that beautiful ninth grader, there's no coming back. No one. I don't, you know, they say, I don't know if I agree with this per se. I'm not, you know, they say that suicide is the most preventable form of death. I don't know if, you know, I, I think, I think the problem I have with that is there's the one way that that comes out is that it's all our responsibility to save one another. And that's, I don't think that's true. I mean, there are certain people that are going to die from suicide. It's just, that's a fact. It's just the way that it is. And I'm not being cavalier about that, but that, that's just the way that it is. You cannot drag somebody to wellness. There needs to be a responsibility on the person. I'm not saying it's easy. But I think to suggest it's the most preventable form of death, what that also would say is that, the, that it's, a person is capable of completely resolving trauma and grief and everything else. And, I, I, and sometimes it's just... I think it's too much. It's just too much. And, and I, I say it to just to add in, I think what's important is an aspect of realism. Because I think if we don't and we lose somebody to suicide, I think we feel like we failed. And then we feel misunderstood. So I think it's, you know, I'm contrarian to, to some of the things that are said in regards to it. Um, the, other, the other thing that comes up, which I don't agree with, is this whole notion that we, those of us who are contemplating and then attempt suicide, really what we should do, we need to know what the impact is going to be on other people. And I'm like, okay, that's illogical because in that moment that I was going to kill myself, I honestly believe that Deanna and the sanctuary and everybody would be far better off. So you're asking me to consider something that's completely arbitrary to how I feel in the moment. I'm not saying that that's not important, but I think if we try to have that be like as a missionary statement, like, okay, well, the way we're going to end suicide is if people realize in that moment that it would, the ripple effect would be devastating. Okay. That doesn't work. It yeah. Doesn't. You wouldn't be having that conversation yeah. if, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah you it helps me, you know, it helps me now 
when Summer, my sweetheart, will sit with me and if I have a suicidal thought and, and we'll talk about what would be the impact, you know, the likelihood is negligible at this point, but I still have the thought. And Summer will say, what would the impact be like on Grace? I'm like, okay, I get it. Like now I understand, but I wouldn't have understood that nine years ago. It's, you have to arrive at this point of understanding. And so I just think, you know, as we, as we endeavor to overcome these maladies, we have to approach it differently. And I think there's a lot of good messages in which if you look at what we can do for a suicidal friend, it's first, talk to them, you know? And that's why question, persuade, and refer. Just question the person, persuade them to stay alive, and then refer them to get help. It's CPR for mental health. You're, you are completely capable of doing that now. And it's leveraging, ultimately, understanding to create connection. That's it. And then you escort them, you journey with them, you companion with them to to somebody who can offer professional support. Our job is not to save people. That's not what we're supposed to do. Our actions ultimately may, but if we go into that with that's our intent, we're gonna screw it up. Two things I wanna bring up before we close um, our conversation. In grief recovery, we try to get people to understand that they don't need to take 100% responsibility for themselves or their lives. They only need to take 1% responsibility. Mm. At least just 1% responsibility. Got it. And so my next question for you then is what role did forgiveness play <laughs> for you? Not only of yourself, but for others in your um, turning your life around. That's such a great question. Yeah, that's, I mean, the, the most difficult has been, of course, to forgive myself, which I still have a hard time doing. Um, and there's where the negative cognition sitting with my beloved is really helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there were some folks, especially at the end, that I think the ending could have been really different in terms of how the sanctuary ended. And it's interesting, if you Google my name, like the second thing that comes up is this person who was a board member accused us of, of fraud at the end, which ultimately there was none. And then if you read through the whole article, it was like how many tens of thousands of dollars that we gave and everything else. But I'm like, why did you do that? I mean, just so I've forgiven that person, you know, to, to, you know, I remember hearing somebody say that, when you, if I were to hold anger with somebody, in fact, what I've done is really, I, I've connected myself with them energetically. And so the forgiveness is probably more beneficial for me than for them. And then, you know, I, I, I think maybe probably one of the worst things I could do is, is if I ever saw this person again, is to say, well, I forgive you. Well, they may not think they've done anything that needs to be forgiven. And so the forgiveness is about me. And it's, it's better. I'm getting better and better and better. And the more that I'm able to do it, it's, it helps. So I, I think I have forgiven. I mean, I've taken responsibility. I've endeavored to make amends to my former beloved and our neighbors and, and the things and even the slight errors that I thought that I had made and, and to express my grief and sorrow that things didn't end differently. So I feel like I've, I've done the best that I could do to make amends, to, to take responsibility. And there's still some remnants to it. And so anytime I have a thought of unforgiveness for others, I try to process that. And in all, to be fully transparent, I still have a really difficult time forgiving myself. It's hard. I think, gosh, I, I should have done this different. I should have done this different. And there's, you know, thank God, because of the extraordinary soul I have as a partner and the, and the other one that I had too, the other person just helped me to look at, okay, you know what? Yes, mistakes happen, you know? And there's somebody, a dear friend of mine was given a talk and, and talked about this whole thing of forgiveness. And she said, well, maybe look at it this way. If it happened again, would you do the same thing? I'm like, wow, no, I wouldn't. I would have done a whole bunch of stuff to them. At the core, I would still be taking care of the animal, but there would be a whole bunch of stuff that I would have done different. She says, okay, then you know what? You learn from it. You know, ultimately, you got to just got to give yourself a break. You know? It's hard, at least for me. So that ties into my next 
next question or point um, or thing I want to ask you. So what did I imagine like in grief and when you feel like that, when you have that shame and things like that, we have this self self-loathing. So what does self-love the opposite of self-loathing what does self-love look like to you now like how do you mm -hmm. how do you give yourself some self-love you know and that, that's difficult too um so i'm really good at working out and and yet there's almost no morning that i wake up and hey ready to go work out and yet i do my thing you know and it's so what I will oftentimes do is I'll look in the mirror and say, you know what, you didn't want to do it and you did it. Like, that's really good. So I'll, I will look for ways, small ways in which I can use the word stomach. That's maybe not people, in which I can accept the acknowledgement of myself. Like, okay, you know what, you've done a good job. And so I think that's at the feeling emotional level in which I can look at myself sometimes literally because I, I have a, body dysmorphia thing, I'm sure, from being raped and some other stuff, but I just, I don't like to look at myself, and I will endeavor to try to, to force myself and then give myself some sort of affirmation. I just, you know what? I think the best thing that I will say to myself, and it feels good, is say, you know what? You're a good dude. You really, you're a really good dude. You're really endeavoring. Yeah, and and, and when I do, it, it, it feels really good. Um, so it's a work in progress. I, I wish, I really wish it wasn't so hard. Um, you know, I, I have battled myself for 50 some years and I still do. Um, it would be, you know, I have some momentary feeling experiences when I'm not, like, when I'm not in opposition myself and it's just like, man, that feels, my God, that feels good. You know, like if, my own worst enemy is myself like that person just didn't show up that day. It's, it's tough. You know, I, I don't know if I'd have the same level of difficulty if I didn't have this condition. And, and I was thinking to kind of circle all the way back, would I have this condition without the trauma that I experienced? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would venture to say no, because my three brothers who I adore, they don't have this. They don't. So they had the same father and they were older when my dad died, but they hadn't suffered this other trauma. So thank God they don't have it. So I don't know. I'm kind of meandering question mark or answer wise. Sorry. No, it's, I <laughs> think, I think we could probably talk another two hours. Um, I would love to. I just want to share, there's one book that I read not long ago. Um, I don't know if you've read it, but breaking the habit of being yourself. Dr. Joe Dispenza wow. just ties in with what we were just talking about because um, okay. you said something and that reminded me of the book title. And uh, the other book I'm reading right now is Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends on It. And I think it does. Yes. And I, I think that's, um, I'm not quite halfway through it, but I think you'll like that book too. Um, okay. just talking about self-loathing to self-love. And I think, I don't know, I do, I mean, just sharing what I've shared and you share what you shared. I, I just think that the, the one truth that I feel now for me is true for me. I don't know that we can give to others what we can't give to ourselves. No, I agree. I, you know what? I totally agree. No. And so, you know, I, I feel not pressure, but I'm motivated to resolve this within myself so I can give it to the kids and my beloved and the world. But no, I, I, I agree. Um, what's, there's a, um, let me use the G word just, just because it'll put it in better context. This great minister who has since made his transition, but a big influence. I love his talking. He, he had said, God can only do for us what God can do through us. So it, in other words, so yeah, it, it's, it, you know, we can't give away what we don't have. It's impossible. And there's where 
you know, I think this whole aspect of self-care, <clears throat> if you say, well, you need to prioritize your self-care and put your self-care on a pedestal, people say, oh, no, 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 you got to put other people first. But okay, you know what? That's doomed to failure. If your cup is empty, if your tank is empty, you have nothing to give. So if I have, if I, if my, if I'm not able to love myself, or let me put it this way, I'm going to be able to love the kids in summer to the extent that I love myself. When I switch it like that, I'm like, ooh, ooh I need to, ooh, okay, all right, I got to make a change because I want to love more, principally because it makes me feel good, you know? I, I feel good. And if that's selfish, so be it. But the better I feel, the more I'm able to be of service to other people. Exactly. In fact, yeah. I, got to, I got to read something to you. This is the other book, the my grandfather's blessing. So check this out. By Show Off Girl. So freaking brilliant. I would love to, this would be on my this is on my bucket list now, is to meet Dr. Remen. She lives in North California. I love her. She must be hiding because I can't find her. <laughs> anyway, it, this is so cool. She says, the best definition of service I have come across is the single word belonging. Service is the final healing of isolation and loneliness. It is the lived experience of belonging. So it's, it's all these things that we do in support of one another. Ultimately, we're the greatest benefactor. Because, you know, when we feel like, I, I mean, I, I'm certain you feel the same way, when we feel like we belong to something, to somebody, somewhere, at some time, in some place, it's all good, you know, or at least it makes it, it it's, it's copable, if that's a word, I don't know if that's a word, but yeah, it's, and it's the last thing, last story, I'll let you go, because I could talk to you for hours, hope awakens harmony, and, and here's what, so we had two puppies at the sanctuary, most everybody else, so we, <clears throat> we had one non-rescued dog, and then it's, I'm crazy about Boston Terrier, so Hope was this brindle-colored, gorgeous, cute, ridiculously wonderful pup. And so while we were waiting for Hope to be weaned from her mom, Deanna went on the dreaded Pet Finder, which is the best pet adoption site in the world. And she came to me and she says, you know, what do you think about this? And it was this picture of an eight, another eight-week-old Boston Terrier puppy, but jet black with this very devilish smile. I'm like, why is this dog on Pet Finder? We'll come to find out she was 100% deaf. And I'm like, what in the hell are we gonna do with a deaf dog? Well, I lost, thankfully I lost the argument and we got Harmony. So we picked up Hope on a, Harmony on a Sunday, Hope on a Monday. And so here's what would happen. I would come into the house and Hope would come to greet me. And then she would turn around and she'd go wake up her sister Harmony who couldn't hear me. And then she bring harmony. So hope awakens harmony. And then I'd be there and all hope and harmony wanted to do is just be with me. There was no demands. It just wanted me to get on my hands and my knees and to cover me with kisses and affirmations and love and to say, Papa, come sit down on the, on the couch with us and let's take a nap. And, and I think it's the same thing in our life is that hope never comes alone. Hope always brings something with it. It could be patience and understanding, but I think it oftentimes is harmony because inherent in harmony, when things are harmonious, like there's a certain aspect of certainty and reliability, like, you know what? It's all going to be okay. And so whatever we can do to step into the door and to be welcomed by hope, we can be guaranteed that hope is going to awaken something else. Most often, it's going to be harmony. There's another book title. I know, I know. Hope awakens harmony. I know, and har. Oh my God, harmony. Um, it's just so. Yeah, so she she had the loudest bark. I mean, it was screeching. It was just like screeching. I don't know because she couldn't hear us. I mean, she was one hundred. People would say, "Don't you want to get her hearing checked?" I'm like, "Okay, let me show you. Let me scream at her." But the other thing is, hope has an aroma. Hope has a certain scent. So. In the times when, say, Hope was with mom or something, and I would walk into the house and Harmony was 
like fast asleep. Hence the true, the, the truth is deaf dogs get the best sleep in the house. That's just the way that it is. So in those instances in which hope wasn't there to awaken her, I would walk up, and this is what happened every time. Sometimes it was instant. Sometimes it would take a minute. Harmony, all of a sudden, Victoria would, boom, her head would swing, I mean, just pop up. Like all of a sudden she could hear and I yelled her name. Well, her scent was so enhanced because of her deafness, you have to think. And then out of a million different scents, somehow she could distinguish mine. And what she would do is her head would pop up and then she would focus her eyes and she would see it was me. And she'd come running at me and dive, literally put her head right in the middle of my chest and move back and forth and then take like these little bites of my skin, which <laughs> hurt. She, like she was with this part, me, this, this being that meant more to her than anything in the world. And so she was awakened by the aroma of hope. And again, I think that, you know, we can be in this catatonic state of, of grief or mental illness or whatever it is. And that little essence of hope, it has a very distinct aroma and, and, and it can awaken us from our slumber and, and ideally, you know, move us into a different place that if nothing else in the moment feels better. So do you think it's part synchronicity, happenstance, and maybe a little bit of intuition as to what we find then that helps us awaken? Oh, absolutely. No, no, I, absolutely. And I think it's, you know, there's this great, again, I, I don't propose any sort of spirituality. I, I, in my own, I'm radically inclusive of life. <laughs> but there's this great, and I, I think it's an African proverb, of pray and move your feet. So in other words, I think we all are gifted with this sense of intuition, but then we, it needs to be activated. So serendipity, you and I, so we could have met, but never had this. So there was the, 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 the universe gave us the gift. The universe orchestrated things so that you and I could meet. Then it sets up, what are we gonna do with it? So we spend this first two hours of our relationship being incredibly connected. So I think it is, but you could also do too much activity and not have enough kind of sacred consideration of what's going on too. So my mother, Suzanne, used to always like to say, she'd say, honey, moderation is the key. Okay, so mom was talking, it's all about balance, you know? Too much of anything, too much sunshine burns you. Too much dog, I don't know if there's an enemy too much dog, but probably so. But yeah, no, so I, I agree with you, you said it beautiful. I, I, I think it's, and I think ultimately we know what's in our best interest. We do. Sometimes though, more often than not, we just need people heading down that road is too scary to do it alone. And like, I don't need you to say anything. I just, would you just please go with me? And I think that that's like, okay, yeah. And, and we can do that for one another. You know, we can drive with somebody to go to their doctor's appointment. You know, hey, this is the first time you've taken medication. How about I go to the pharmacy with you? Just, you know? And they may not want it, but imagine somebody offering that. You know, like on the first day that you're gonna take medication, like, would you like me to go with you? to the pharmacy and we can pick that up together. Wow. And I think it is those simple acts. It's just, they're, they come with what I call the power of an unexpected gesture because we don't, we don't expect people to do those sorts of things. <sighs> so good. <laughs> You're so good. Thank is you. There is there anything else that you would like to share with my audience? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, the big the thing is, I, I think, God, I don't know if you can handle one more story. All right, I'll try to abbreviate it. I just, <clears throat> I hadn't told this, I just told this for the first time last night. I've written about it. So here's the truth. I think what happens is, <clears throat> We, we see a circumstance. It goes back to this whole thing that I think oftentimes we're, we don't think we're qualified or capable. But what if I told you that you can save a life just by sitting down? So 
one of the Boston Terriers that came to the sanctuary was a dog named Murphy. And again, you had to fit into one of these four categories. And when Murphy arrived, I'm like, my God, this dog is stunningly gorgeous. Got along with everybody, loved Deanna and I. And I'm like, okay, someone like kind of slipped him in on the radar. Like he had no special need at all. But not long after he got there, the first time he ate, he ate and ate and ate and then threw up everything. So I thought, okay, maybe he's a little nervous. Well, it happens the next day, same thing. It happens the next day, same thing. Like, okay, well, something must be wrong. Take him to the vet. So like, God, I mean, his vitals are good. And we don't, I don't know, nothing's wrong. And so it keeps going on. Well, Deanna is just this amazing soul. And every animal that came to the sanctuary became her baby. And so she's like, okay, we're going to figure this out. And so lo and behold, Deanna figures out that Murphy has this thing called megasophagus. So in other words, his esophagus is enlarged to the point where it doesn't contract. It can't do its job to take the food from the mouth and the throat down to the stomach. And absent that, a, a dog standing on all fours, so what happens is he'll die because he eats, it goes part way down the throat, but it, the esophagus doesn't move it along. And so he doesn't throw up, he regurgitates. It looks the same, but it's different. So dogs die from this. So Dee is like, okay, well that ain't gonna happen on, on my watch. So she comes up with this brilliant solution. So she watches Murphy eat and she knows the point, the exact time when he's eaten enough and, but he's, you know, he's, he's about to regurgitate. And so she scoop him up and prop him up head and back against her chest. And she say, okay, babe, sit down. And then she'd give Murphy to me, just like you would with, imagine like the crown jewels being passed over. And then I would sit there with Murph, his back against my chest, his head on my shoulder, his whiskers tickling my cheek. And a lot of times we would just fall asleep. In that position, just propping him up, life as gravity did the job of malfunctioning anatomy and brought the food down into the place where then if we sat there long enough, he could consume it. And Murph always knew when the time was up, it was usually about 30, 30 minutes or so, and then he would jump down and play. And so that's how his life was saved. We save a life by sitting down. And I think the same thing that's happening, be it grief or anything else, is we can have a seat and have a conversation with somebody. We can have a seat and have a meal. We can have a seat and watch a movie. We can have a seat and go visit them in the psychiatric hospital. We can have a seat in our car and trance and go with them somewhere we can all save lives just by sitting down. And so I think my final message is just that, just never underestimate, kind of paraphrasing what the great Maya, Maya Angelou said, <clears throat> never underestimate what an individual's small act of kindness can do to change a life. And in fact, <clears throat> I'll end with this last thing and I promise I will let you go. There was an amazing psychiatrist, Dr. Drew Ramsey in New York, and he has this one quote in which he talks about the issue of suicide as a problem and a solution, one short paragraph. And these are Dr. Ramsey's words, not mine. Dr. Ramsey tells us, someone you see today is thinking about killing themselves. <laughs> your smile, your question, your love could save them. Trust me, they told me it did. That's, that's it. Yeah, that's impactful. He's a pretty cool dude. He's a brilliant guy. Well, folks, if uh, you don't look at your dog the same after today. <laughs> Jiggy's outside the door right now, kind of whining. I'm like, okay. Jiggy, oh, there Aww. he is. <laughs> but no, really, I mean, it makes it memorable. Like the storytelling of all the stories that you've shared makes it memorable. It makes it relatable. It makes it impactful. Um, that's genius, by the way. Um, and I, I just love how you've tied it into your message. Um, well, thank you thank so you. much. Well, yeah, and, and all credit to my former beloved and the great people and the amazing animals. And you are so welcome. And again, I can never thank you enough for what you're doing. Just, you know, the, to to take this topic and have it be your passion and to be of selfless service to so many people. You, you're a lot like you may not be given the gift to know how many people that you save and, and unburden, but it's a new one.
And because you don't just help that person, that person then helps somebody else and somebody else and somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. So you and Gizmo, you guys got the whole thing. It is my mission that we talk about grief like we talk about the weather. Mm. Got it. And I okay. say, let's make mental illness a casserole disease. When someone comes home and is suffering from mental illness, let's bring them a baked good just like we would in any other instance. I love that. I love that. So many quotes. Uh, no, so kinda, many quotes. Kind of goofy. No, oh, I love it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to like, I might do this in two parts, actually, this podcast episode. Um, and please know whatever I can do to, to serve you or anybody else, you know, if somebody that wants to talk or whatever, want to hear a story, just I'm here to serve. It's my job. I love it. Um, I'm actually going to put all the things that you mentioned in the show notes, reference in the show notes. Um, and thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Uh, for sharing your story, for going first. It's, uh, like I said, we never fully arrive, no. but we never journey alone either. We shouldn't no. be journeying alone. No, no, amen. Well, you are a delight and a joy, and I have a new lifelong friend, so. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your trust and confidence. Thank you for choosing me. My intuition. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Well, hug, hug Gizmo for me. Air hugs. Air hugs, right on. Thank you so much. Um, and everybody, I hope you enjoyed this episode uh, or two. I think I might do two. I don't know. We'll see. But um if this was helpful to you, please share it with somebody you know or love. Um, and share the love on Apple Podcasts if you know, leave a review for David's fantastic words of wisdom. And remember, when you unleash your heart, you unleash your life. Much love. <laughs>